This is the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. A change of pace on this week's show. And we're going to be talking about a very important topic. You know, you can just check a little box on your driver's license and you really don't think too much about it. Are you an organ donor? Yes or no? It's a very powerful question and one that my next guest has a very powerful story to share with us. And I'm very happy to welcome to the program. She is an author. She is an advocate. She is a speaker. Her name is Sarah Gray, and I'm so grateful to have you here today. Thanks for having me, Chuck. You have the book in front of you, which you have written, uh, Life Everlasting, uh, which is very powerful because this is a subject that hits extremely close to home for you. So why don't we start, um, if you could just share with our listeners your story and, and how you became involved in tissue donation. Sure. Uh, well, in September of 2009, I learned I was pregnant with identical twins. And when my husband and I went for the second sonogram, we learned that one of the twins was healthy, but that the other had a lethal birth defect called anencephaly. So um, the doctors explained that babies with this diagnosis typically die in utero or within a few minutes, hours, or days of being born, and that there was nothing that could be done to prevent or, you know, there was nothing that could be done to help the baby. We just had to carry the pregnancy to term and realize that one of the babies was going to live and the other one was going to die shortly. Mm. So we had about five months of time to prepare for the birth and for the death, and um, I looked into organ donation. Did you have a hand in choosing where these organs were directed to? The... No. Um, there was, well, I should say the, the cord blood, that was our choice, but we found the only study that we knew of on anencephaly, so the cause of the disease that our son had, and signed up for that separate. So um, we signed up for that before he died, and it required cord blood of both twins and then a blood draw for me and my husband. Mm. Aside from that, we just donated to the system, and the system chose the, the studies that the organs went to. And after about a year, um, well, you know, WRTC invited us to grief counseling, and it's a free service that they offer to any family locally, if, whether you donate or not free grief counseling. So that's just a public service announcement. To, right. to, for, for Some organ procurement organizations do this. It was great. And we got to meet about 15 other families who donated for transplant, which was such an eye-opener. And when I met all these people who, they were all on the do donating end. Mm -hmm. So these were the loved ones of people who died. They went around the circle, I guess like an AA meeting, like, hello, my name is so-and-so. I'm here talking, you know, my, my son got shot by an accidental gunshot wound and mm -hmm. he donated six organs and he saved six people and some of them you know wrote the family letters to say thank you wow right yeah i that gave me like a tingle up my arm i was like that's really For powerful sure. yeah and then one by one each person went by and said oh you know my husband died and he donated two lungs and he saved two people and i got a letter too i was like wow you guys are getting letters and i was so jealous i was like oh i you know my son donated to research i didn't get a letter or you know, I don't know the names of any of the researchers. I don't know what they're working on. I don't know if I don't know if this donation made a difference at all. That's the real question that was in my mind. Right. Was it worthwhile to do this? And of course, my son's life already had meaning to me because he's my son. Of course. But I wanted to know if his life meant something more to other people. So I asked WRTC, could I write a letter to the researchers? And they said, no, we don't have that kind of program for research. Hmm. Um, so I just was like, okay, I tried. I'm not going to push it. But then a year later, I had a business trip to Boston. And I knew that my son's corneas had been sent to Boston. And I Googled where the lab was that got his corneas. And I looked at where my hotel was. And I was able to, um, I called the receptionist while I was there. I explained who I was. And I said, could I just have a tour of the lab? Like, I'm curious about what is happening. And they said that they had never done this kind of thing before. But yeah, I was welcome to come and tour the lab. So I got to meet the researcher. I got, I got to meet one of the researchers who said he was probably the one that put in the request for the corneas. Wow, okay. So I got to ask him, like, you know, why? Why, why do you need these for? And like, 
do you just get corneas mailed to you in the mail? Like, how does this even work? How do you get a cornea? <laughs> you know, like, it's such a strange... It is a weird thing, you know? It's, you yeah. can't exactly go on eBay and, well, you know, that's, search I'm for like, corneas. Is there a catalog? Like, yeah. how do they do this? <laughs> so w- what did you learn? I mean, what did they learn from his corneas? Oh, it was fascinating. They He confirmed that they were shipped via FedEx. Okay. And he showed me where, which... That didn't really gross me out or anything. I was just more intellectually, academically curious. Like, yeah. how does one do this? How yeah. does this happen? Yeah. I was there, so I know what the beginning part was. What was the next step? It was fascinating what they did with the corneas. Um, based on, so everything was de-identified, and there are HIPAA regulations and all these things about taking away the identity of me and my son. Mm-hmm. But they're my HIPAA rights, and I can waive them if I want. Of course. Right? Of course. So, um, based on, so I revealed some information to the researcher, the date of the death and everything like this. And he said, well, you know, I'm not allowed to say for sure. But based on what you've told me, I believe that this is the study that would have been done on corneas that came in around that time. Um, and they are trying to determine if corneas, which have many layers, I think five layers, and there's certain layers that don't regenerate. If you lose those cells, you lose your eyesight and it never comes back. Hmm. But they're trying to find a way to put umbilical cord blood or stem cells onto the corneal cells and see if they can regenerate. So wow. ultimately, the idea is that you wouldn't need a cornea transplant. You could get like stem cell eye drops. Wow. Instead, right? That's some serious it's science. Fascinating. That yeah. is serious science. This is Harvard, man. This is what they do up yeah, there. Yeah, right? So they found that the research was promising. You know how scientists are. Yeah. They, of you course. Know, they yeah, won't yeah. say anything, but right. they're just like, well, the research showed that this is potentially possible. Um, so that's been fascinating to track. Absolutely. And also the study that they showed me has pictures of what may be my son's eye cells in it. Holy cow. That I have in a frame at home. Wow. And we even had an artist make a watercolor of the eye cells. Now that's cool. Right? Yeah. And every now and then I check the study to see how many other studies have cited it. You know, the same way um, many people, you know, if you want to feel the presence of your loved one that has passed, you could go to their grave and visit them. I can do that. We have He's buried nearby. But I also will, you know, look up the study and count how many citations from other studies have used this information from this study to go into their study. Yeah, yeah. And as of last week, it was 31. Wow. I know. That's that's incredible. Right? 31. Yeah. That's power. That's that's reaching. I mean, a he lot made of a people. difference. He made Absolutely. a difference. There's no question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that sounds like kind of a, a unique scenario there, where you were actually able to go and, and to tour the lab and, and find out a little bit more about the research. Were you able to do that with any other? You were all of them. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Well, once I did it the first time, then I was able to do it again after that. Um, I, I contacted WRTC and I told them what I did. They freaked out. Um, (laughs) Well, look at you, you rebel. We told you there was no program in place. No, no, they weren't mad. They were scared for me. They said, these researchers aren't trained on how to talk to donor families. You know, they have this whole training program for transplant people and and donor families to meet each other. Mm -hmm. And they have all these protocols in place and they've learned all these best practices on how to do this. So here I was just like test pilot by myself going in and if he had said something really mean to me or if they'd said something you know like oh your son's corneas are just like an office supply to us we put them in the corner and whatever you know that could have been really painful sure but luckily for me and for the people who have also come after me and done this the first time that I tried it it worked beautifully and the people that welcomed me said "Uh, we're never going to forget meeting you and we want you to stay in touch with us Mm. And I have been invited back to speak at their uh, lab. I would imagine that was quite the powerful connection, quite the powerful connection for everybody involved. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So after that happened, I told WRTC that I did it. They Mm -hmm. were shocked but supportive Mm -hmm. and said, we are amazed that you did that. And I said, could you help me do it with the liver? Like, now that I've done it once, I'm not trying to make anyone uncomfortable, violate anything. All I'm saying is I'm a donor mom. I'm a bereaved mom. I donated. 
can I get can I get a tour of your lab just like you would give a member of the public? And WRTC did help me do that. Cool. So we visited Cytonet. They got the liver. I got to meet the woman that held my son's liver in her hands. Oh wow! And she was amazing. Like these scientists were brilliant and so respectful of the donation. They had said that they never had a donor family visit them before, and they were so excited that, you know, they handle these livers that come in from all over the country. They know it didn't get there by itself. Every liver has a story. Mm-hmm. And as human beings, they're scientists, but they're also human beings, they always wonder about the lives of the people that are touched. Wow. And so they were, they welcomed me and my family. They had, they made lunch for us. They had a conference room that, and we told stories about, they told stories about what they did. I told stories about my family. I shared pictures of Thomas and um, they gave us a tour of the lab. That's, and, and have you been able to track the studies and citations with that as well? Yes. That one, they used Thomas's liver in a six liver study to determine the best temperature to freeze infant liver cells for a therapy that they're doing that helps. It's a bridge therapy. So if a baby needs a liver transplant and he's too little to get one or the liver's not available yet, they will liquidate a liver and give the new give the baby some of the liquid liver, the mm-hmm. hepatocytes, mm-hmm. the liver cells, to keep it alive while it's waiting for a liver transplant. And so Thomas's liver kind of helped inform how they do that. Wow. That's so awesome. So was, before making the decision to donate Thomas's organs, what was your perception of research like this? Did you have any preconceived notions? I suppose I did. I had no scientists or researchers that I know of in my family. I've never been to a lab. I'd never been able to talk to a PhD or a researcher about what they do. All I knew was what I see on TV and read in the newspaper. Right. It seemed abstract and distant to me to donate to research. Um, And I also had heard, you know, bad stuff like the Tuskegee experiments or Henrietta Lacks stories or stories where because researchers are behind closed doors, like they can just get away with whatever they want. Sure. So I was a little concerned, like, do I want to donate to research? But um, I also thought, like, I know parts of research must be good because that's how we have all these medications. And Of course. I mean, sharing your story now, do you have any idea of how many people you've influenced by your decision and by sharing your story? Um, it's probably in the millions. Holy moly. It's probably in the millions. Um, I've told the story and I've gotten lots of emails from people and emails from other organ procurement groups around the country who will say, we never tried this before, but since we heard your story, we tried it for the first time and it worked and now we have a protocol and now we do it. I'm literally just a person who went through the process and got curious and just wanted to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. And every person I tell about this finds it fascinating and interesting. And I feel like every time I tell someone, they open their mind a little bit about what research is. Sure. And I get questions, the same questions that I asked when I was at their stage of knowledge, which is like, how does it work? You know, do they mail them? Do they do this? And how does that work? So now I'm kind of an ambassador for research. (laughs) But if more people had the opportunity that I did, then we wouldn't need so many ambassadors, right? Absolutely. When you can understand the impact, and then you can really understand the power, and you can understand that making this decision, I'm taking an active role in this community.